Yeah, I might have been wrong about that Beyonce class at Yale University. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here at I Mix What I Like. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. So the other morning on the Remix Morning Show over there on Black Liberation Media, we had a brief discussion about Professor Daphne Brooks at Yale University and her forthcoming course on Beyonce. I suggested, given a previous many years ago reading of Daphne Brooks's essay in Step Into a World about Oprah's book club, about the presentation of black womanhood and Toni Morrison as a, sort of a magical Negro type of figure who was there to help white affluent women, the target audience of Oprah, transgress, transcend, I should say, their lot in life, their struggles against patriarchy, isolation, or whatever else that they might have been suffering. The point being, at the time, I thought it was a great assessment of the role of Oprah Winfrey, the role of pop culture, the role of television, advertising, though that wasn't specifically Brooks's focus. And I suggested that just hearing about her new class about Beyonce at Yale, despite what was being said in, in public or in commercial news interviews, that it may be a way to get people into those classes. African-American studies, black studies are always struggling to populate courses and make themselves relevant to their parent institutions. So this may have been another way of just getting people into the classroom, popularizing the field, and then having people deeply engage a critical assessment of black life, history, study, and maybe even reveal some of the interrelationship between the material world and the immaterial world as it's presented in pop culture, media, celebrity, et cetera. I did reach out to Professor Brooks. There's still an open-ended invitation for her to join me and us here. But in the interim, I took a quick look at one of her more recent books, the, the award-winning Liner Notes for the Revolution, The Intellectual Life of Black Feminist Sound. So just to look a little bit here at the introduction and then the epilogue, admitting I have not read much of the pages in between, just trying to get an idea of how Brooks might be approaching the subject. And I think even within what I've read here, there's some suggestion as to why I might have been wrong in my assessment the other morning and where this class may be heading. But obviously we can continue the conversation, read more of this book and and see if Professor Brooks uh, decides to join us or produce more that we can review on the subject. Uh, but I, anyway, I just thought that this was kind of interesting here. From the introduction, uh, she's setting up a situation where she's talking about black women largely being underappreciated in how they are assessed, studied, appreciated, in this case, in their contributions musically, uh, aesthetically, symbolically, and as it says here, as providing so a, a, a kind of cultural, symbolic, aesthetic support for or supplement to uh, uh, black politics, political struggle. But one of the things that seems to be happening is something that I admit I have a bias against, which is an emphasis almost exclusively on aesthetic and symbol messaging uh, and not much about how it relates to the material world, either in terms of changing it or supplementing the struggle that it's sort of vaguely, uh, that these, that these uh, artistic works are sort of vaguely associated with. And as we're going to see when she talks at the end of the book about Beyonce, there's, there's none of that. So whereas I at least remember the previous point being made about the way, in terms of how, that is how Brooks approached Oprah, Toni Morrison in that Step Into a World essay, was to demonstrate what was not happening for black people by the presentation of blackness to a largely white affluent audience. This present approach seems to be saying something else. So for instance, here Brooks writes, black women's musical practices are in short, 
revolutionary because they are inextricably linked to the matter of black life. Their strategies of performance perpetually and inventively philosophize the prodigiousness of this of its scope. But also, and quite crucially, black women's musical practices are revolutionary because of the ways in which said practices both forecast and execute the viability and potentiality of black life. This is not, I argue, a pessimistic operation, though the book does throughout take seriously the ways that various artists have wrestled with the ongoing crisis of precarity hanging over blackness and its conditions of possibility. As we shall see, the performers and their accompanying scribes and theorists who po populate liner notes for the revolution, the sisters who were getting it all down for the record, are in this together and they are busy, as the literary lioness Toni Morrison might say, busy being original, complicated, changeable human. Theirs is a revolution in intellectual labor. I use the term labor here very self-consciously so as to reference black radical tradition theorist Cedric Robinson's classic observations about the way that black work matters in relation to modern life. It's also interesting here to see Brooks invoke the black worker, the section from Black Reconstruction by Du Bois, a very material look at the, the way this society was set up during enslavement and post-enslavement during Re Reconstruction to, as he said in that book, return black labor and the black worker to the status of the slave. It's interesting that that is invoked in this, this section because while Du Bois is making a very material, data-driven political argument in that book, Brooks seems to be making an immaterial, symbolic argument about the power of black womanhood and performance absent entirely from an actual look of the conditions of the people or even the way the music industry might impact those workers and their aspirations in terms of shaping them, limiting them, rebranding them, etc. Brooks writes, in the pages that follow, I've dedicated myself to instead turning our attention to the women artists and thinkers who have invented their own radical theories and tales and philosophies about sound and who have innovated sonic aesthetics outside and beyond the center. And though I don't think revolution is defined in the way she talks briefly about labor, but she does say here in the preceding paragraph to the one I just read a second ago, these women, this book argues, are culture makers who often labor right before our eyes, right before our very eyes and ears without our recognition of the magnitude of their import. And the revolution that they waged was one in which the articulation of more life could, for the dispossessed people, be sounded out in many registers and tied to the core meaning of the vision of liberation itself. Implicit in so much of their work is the stirring and glorious declaration once made by Zora Neale Hurston that you don't know us Negroes. The revolution that they waged was one in which the articulation of more life could, for a dispossessed people, be sounded out in many registers and tied to the core meaning and vision of liberation itself. So one of the first clues that I got towards the political trajectory of this book was the previous statement about revolution being just loosely referenced uh, and not defined in any any in any way, maybe more clear than I or many others of us might talk about it in in general. But the point being that 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 it's not. I think that that so much of the approach being about aesthetic and symbol that there's more focus on that than defining what a, a political revolution might be or look like or what politics are at play here, so on and so forth. But when she references that as Brooks references the 2015 Grammys performance in her and Beyonce's history making lemonade, I got a suggestion of, of where this might be going and where Brooks continues that Lemonade, uh, Beyonce's 2016 sonic visual multimedia black feminist magnum opus stands as the curatorial summation of the citational practices she has been honing for nearly two decades as a pop icon. Uh, there's actually several references to Lemonade as this, this as a magnum opus, as Beyonce's black feminist magnum opus. So there was that. But it's here in the epilogue where Brooks asks, asks, can you dig it with Beyonce that I think it becomes most clear where this course is likely to be headed. That is her course at Yale about Beyonce. Beyonce Knowles' 2016 black feminist magnum opus, Lemonade, her New Orleans reclamation manifesto, again calling it Lemonade, her black feminist magnum opus, and that it was a, a New Orleans reclamation manifesto. And then in referencing historian Lakeisha Simmons, 
Daphne Brooks says here that Yancey too, Simmons argues, merges past landscapes with the present to center black women within narratives of the U.S. nation. And, and every time I see something like that, I think again of, of Harold Cruz's caution of, of saying what happens when your cultural expression becomes part of this country's cultural store. And I, and I feel like the co-optation always works in the way that most folks wish it would not. That is, lemonade was not some condemnation or recentering of black womanhood within the narrative of the U.S. nation. It was allowing the narrative of the U.S. nation the false narrative of the U.S. nation to re-consume or consume anew the expression, the pained expression of those they oppress. And then as we're going to see here, I think in a moment, Brooks' focus even it has to acknowledge that Lemonade was largely Beyonce's warning to her husband. And it reminds me of a critique similar to one raised years ago in a presentation I gave about Django, where Django presents a history of, of rebellion as being more about one man trying to save one woman as opposed to collectives ending the institution of slavery, which was in fact more common among those who were rebelled, particularly by the time that film was meant to be depicting in the mid 19th century. So, or the early to mid 19th century. So. This feels like another, again, Beyonce creates this perhaps beautiful and nicely sounding condemnation of her one man's behavior, and it gets projected as a black feminist magnum opus. <laughs> perhaps, maybe. Brooks continues, citing Edward Glissant's poetics of landscapes allow black women to critique the boundaries of transatlantic slavery, rewrite national narratives, respatialize feminism, and develop new pathways across traditional geographic arrangements. They also offer, she adds, several reconceptualizations of space and place, repositioning black women as geographic subjects who provide spatial clues as to how more humanly workable ge geographies might be imagined. And before her was Chicana feminist scholar Brady, who made the contention that we should take seriously how the imbrication of the temporal within the spatial illustrates that in spite of the long colonial neoliberal project's seemingly successful abstraction of space, in spite of a long systemic game to convert people's land into geometric homogeneities and a quantitative set of ideas from that of vibrant human dwelling, in spite of the tenacity of capitalist expansion and state surveillance, they, there are nonetheless alternative conceptions of the spatial that challenge oppressive alignments of power and instead privilege revolutionary sociologies. Again, and I'm not meaning this as a, as a specific reference to the broader work here of Brooks, but that is an argument I tend to be biased against, admittedly, because it passes over what it means to be in a colonial neoliberal project. It passes over what it means within that context to produce culture that claims a successful abstraction of space, that claims to move in spite of the tenacity of capitalist expansion and state surveillance. In other words, those concepts or those, those ideas or those structures are passed over very quickly to move toward the preferred aesthetic, symbolic, sonic creation. And in so doing, the, the analysis in this case may, and then in other cases often does, diminish the impact of those structures on the art in terms of their function, what they mean, how they play symbolically. In other words, instead of successfully abstracting space and, and resisting geometric homogeneities and create, and, 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 and despite claims that, that uh, 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 of challenging alignments of power and privileging race, revolutionary socialities, what often ends up happening is those revolutionary symbols and concepts and ideas are rebranded within the context of a colonial neoliberal project to to work against the political aspirations of the targeted population. So in here, there's no discussion of the Pepsi contract, the tour, the commercials, the broader political commentary or activism or the the nonsensical black capitalist philanthropy that, that Beyonce and her husband engage in. Like all of that is suppressed underneath 
in, in order to privilege symbol aesthetic. So this is why Brooks, so Brooks continues here, this is the undergirding philosophy of Lemonade, that black women activists, mothers of the movement and culture workers, musicians and dancers, athletes and actors, legendary chefs and Mardi Gras masqueraders might re-inhabit the ruins of our spurned his, his spurned his his wilderness with our wildly sensual and sumptuous celebra- celebratory selves and ultimately birth a new time and re- uh, restorative new collectives. Even before we hit rock bottom in the parking lot with her, our Lady Knowles is on a subterranean expedition in Lemonade, one that is loaded with counter-historical meaning, taking us to a place where buried new world truths lie. She is our sonic archivist, the one who banana dances to the beat of Josephine, the one who does it proud Mary style like Electric Tina, the one who drops stank like f- stank funk like Betty in a spy movie. Set. I mean, and on and on and on and on. But when I've watched Lemonade or Beyonce's HBCU project from some years ago, or whenever these things, you know, the the purpose isn't to invite audiences in to the histories, to an explanation of what happened, to 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 show how those histories are playing out today in the material reality and lived experiences of the people, black women in particular. That's not what happens. So what ends up happening is that all of those histories and realities are suppressed underneath sort of underneath sort of a good feeling of the banana dancing, electric proud Mary, and so on and so forth. It is a work that releases the pent up energy of black folks, folks misbegotten value, that which is stored up in the sent- sediment of our culture and sends it back to the atmosphere. Of the work's many gripping black feminist statements that broke unprecedented ground in the pop music imaginary, statements about the specificities of black women's historical injury, the intersections of mourning, of melancholy, of racial trauma as it manifests itself at the level of hetero intimacies, the quant- quality and potentiality of reparative futures, the symbolism that intrigues me the most is that in which Yance appears underneath it all and in the dankest and the most mundane of settings compared with all of the those bucolic vistas she walks, rides, and glides through across the span of video. Now, again, maybe, no, not again, let me say for the first time, just clearly, if you haven't picked up already, this is beautifully written. I mean, Brooks is, is I mean, it's not for a lack of talent here. It's just, it's just no harm, no foul. What is likely, given my bias for similar, similarly made arguments, it's just a disagreement that I'm having with what all of this is meant to mean both in the political imaginary and then in the, the political actions taken as a result by people who are, are, are made audiences to this music. And since none of the context, at least here, is offered in terms of the music industry, the colonial relationship that, that or, the, or I should say, the, the relationship the music industry plays in maintaining a colony, all of that is, is somehow overcome by the aesthetic and the sound and the performance and the imaginary that is evoked in people like Brooks, but I don't know that is, 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 I don't know how you would measure to what extent general audiences appreciate, understand, or are moved in the directions that Brooks may be herself. I, I, don't, I don't know how that's determined. By the way, I may be misreading this, but if anybody can help me out on this claim here, I'd be interested that in Brooks' discussion of Don't Hurt Yourself, Brooks says here that after saying, taking sort of passing shot at, at, at Led Zeppelin's lead guitarist Jimmy Page's anti-blackness, which I may have missed is news to me, but I'm not doubting. Brooks writes here that on the song Don't Hurt Yourself, which I went back and listened to, that there's a cover, the band, that there's, a rhythm signature from the from the Led Zeppelin's cover of When the Levee Breaks in Don't Hurt Yourself. I didn't hear that at all. The 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 drumming on Don't Hurt Yourself sounds nothing like Bonham's drumming on When the Levee Breaks. But I if I maybe I'm misreading this, don't understand. I'm 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 open to be caught up on that too, but I just thought that was interesting. And then the book concludes here with Beyonce's lemonade kicking down the door between black past and futures, pulling us toward the light and willing us to come up for air, take a deep breath. So that's it. Just a quick look at a quick brief 
an oversimplification, I'm sure, of the broader argument that Brooks is making here, but something that I just thought suggested the direction she might be going in with this class at Yale about Beyonce. It doesn't seem like it's going to do, if this is the trajectory, I'm not sure we're going to get the kind of critique that I would love to see, of course, develop. I mean, I think Beyonce could, could produce or provides a lot that could be used to offer up a wonderful explanation of how the society works racially, gender, pop culturally, celebrity wise, and so on and so forth. But it would have to be done more as a critique than a praise song, which it appears is is the approach here. Uh, so again, it's not about the personal, certainly with Professor Brooks or with, with artists like Beyonce, it's about the function that all of this is meant to play in the context of maintaining a settler colony, as is the case here. But let's keep the conversation going. Big shout out to, to our patrons and members who are getting this video first. When you all, the rest of you, get to see this, please do first ask yourself why you're not a member or a patron, and then do as they've done. But much more to come on this and related subjects. So make sure you come on back. Make sure you have the bell rung so you don't miss anything. And as always, peace, only if you're willing to fight for it. As Fred Hampton used to say, and I'll catch you next time right here at I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.